What a pleasure to look out and see a full house on a gorgeous spring day. Uh, I was just telling our speaker, uh, Dambisa Moyo, I said this is a real tribute to you. Uh, and I think you're going to be delighted that uh, you chose to come inside and hear uh, her today rather than be outside. My name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, and before I go into anything, I wanted first to acknowledge Professor Meyer Cohen from the Economics Department, without whose support and help uh, this event would not have taken place today. So I would very much like to thank you for what you've done. Um, we are now in the, uh, the third term of this academic year. And uh, our lecture today is part of our Great Issues series of lectures. And um, we've had this going on now for about seven years at the Dickey Center. And once a term, uh, we invite a, a speaker uh, to, to address a major theme or issue. Uh, and this is done to, uh, in effect, perpetuate the memory and the legacy of, professor, of uh, President John Sloan Dickey, uh, the former president of Dartmouth, who most of you know was a very strong internationalist and a very uh, a person who felt very strongly uh, that Dartmouth students needed to know uh, about the major international issues of the day and what I think is equally important, a commitment to do something about them. So this series of lectures uh, is uh, in his honor and in his memory. Our issue today is a fascinating one, and um, uh, Dr. Dambisa Moyo has uh, really pointed attention to uh, one of the really perplexing issues of, of the day, and that is why uh, one of the most perplexing issues in international development, I should say, and that is why uh, despite the billions of dollars uh, that many countries have uh, offered an assistance to Africa, that Africa is still poor, suffering from underdevelopment, uh, poor governance, and a variety of other ailments. Uh, and why is that the case? Uh, what, what has been the problem? And many people have addressed this from various different perspectives. And our speaker today offers a very different and somewhat controversial, which I'm very happy to say, uh, because we always like to uh, have controversies here and, and good spirited debate. And her answer basically is that uh, the aid itself uh, is largely to blame. Uh, the nature of the aid, sometimes the purposes in which it's given, uh, and then also problems in terms of the recipient country and, and their, uh, their reactions. Um, and as you know, uh, development aid really is a byproduct of the end of World War II, the period of decolonization. Uh, and, you know, it began as we were talking earlier today uh, with uh, Dr. Moyo that it really began with very, very good altruistic intentions of helping countries that were newly independent uh, get on their feet and move forward. Unfortunately, uh, it has not, uh, uh, has not developed that way. Now, our speaker today is very interesting not only because of her message, uh, but also because of her experiences, which are, are really fascinating. And let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Dambisa Moyo. She was born and raised in Zambia, uh, southern Africa. She completed a PhD in economics at Oxford University and holds a master's degree from Harvard University. She completed a bachelor's degree in chemistry and an MBA in finance at American University in Washington, D.C. She then worked at Goldman Sachs for eight years in the debt capital markets, uh, hedge fund coverage, and in global macroeconomics teams. Previously, she also worked at the World Bank in Washington. She is a member of the boards of London, London L-U-N-D-I-N Petroleum and S.A.B. Miller. She is a patron uh, for Absolute Return of Kids, ARK, 
a hedge fund supported children's charity. And she serves on the boards of the London for Africa Foundation and Room to Read, an educational charity. She's the author of a book which I saw uh, very much in evidence around campus today, Dead Aid. I saw many students uh, reading it and uh, I was very, very happy to see that. And finally, uh, she was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2009. So we are really delighted to have uh, Dambisa Moyu with us today and please let's give her a very warm welcome. Hello, oh, you can hear me. Hi everyone and good afternoon. Uh, it's a bit low. Um, I have no idea what you're doing indoors when it's so beautiful outside. Uh, I'm not even sure that uh, aid to Africa is a big enough issue to, to keep me indoors. I would have definitely been outside. Um, obviously, um, as, as people, I've been kind of, my generation's moved on, but uh, obviously uh, the younger generation has become much more serious about, uh, about school than my day. But um, it's good to see everybody here. And I think probably, and I hope, that the fact that you're here is an indication that uh, you are as concerned as I am about the ex existing predicament and situation across the African continent. Um, what I would like to do with, to, with you today is actually walk you through some of my arguments as to why it is, although um, we have very good intentions uh, around supporting and helping Africa, um, why it is that the help is actually um, hurting and not helping the African continent. When I wrote this book a year ago, um, one of the things that I hadn't anticipated was just how uh, much of an emotional issue um, this book would, would become and how much of an emotional issue Aid to Africa is. My intention was really to highlight some of the, the uh, debate that's been going on in the economics literature for many years now. And I thought that I should write a book that would bring in other people, people who perhaps are not as au fait with the issues around um, Aid to Africa. I want to start today by saying that very often we're quite inclined, um, we live in a society where people are inclined to put us into different boxes. Um, you're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, or he's black, she's white, she's between 20 and 30, and he's between 60 and 65. So we're constantly trying to put people in boxes, and I thought um, what I would start with here today is to say, rather than say she's against aid and he's for aid, is to remind us of the things that we agree upon around the issue um, of Africa. And in particular, there are three things I think we agree on. First of all, I believe that we all agree that we hope that Africa will one day not, to be de not need to be dependent on aid. Um, I think we all want a time when Africa and Africans can become equal partners on the global stage and that Africa will no longer have to be a recipient continent um, sitting around and waiting for aid from the international community. By the way, I always give people an option. If there are people who would like to see poverty continue in Africa and more aid to Africa, um, please, please do put your hand up and we can have that discussion. But I hope the first point is clear and I think we all agree. Whether we're pro-aid or against aid, that's irrelevant. The fact of the matter is we all want to see a day when Africa doesn't need to be dependent on aid. The second thing that I think we all agree on is that we need African governments to be motivated and involved in Africa's development. It makes absolutely no sense or, and is of no use really if me as an individual from Africa care about my continent or my country more than my government. It also doesn't matter if you as individuals in the United States care about what's happening in Africa if African governments don't care. And it also doesn't matter if the American government or the international community cares about Africa, but the African governments also don't care. We have to figure out a way to make sure that African governments not only care about their countries and their continent, but they're incentivized to do the right thing. The third thing that I believe we agree on is actually a point that I've stolen from a minister, Solheim, who is the Minister of International Development in Norway. Um, about a year ago, just when the book came out, I was invited um, to Norway. I'd never been. 
Um, people in the audience might be aware that Norway gives 1% of its income to aid. And I was quite surprised. I was like, why the heck are they inviting me to go to Norway when I've just written a book that's criticizing the aid system? In any case, I'd never been to Oslo, never been to Norway. I thought, what the heck, they're paying, I might as well go. <laughs> so I jumped on a plane and I went to Norway and had a fascinating trip there. And at one of the um, meetings with Minister Solheim, as I said, the Minister of International Development, we were in a forum with a number of journalists. And the minister said, and I'm paraphrasing here, we all have to accept and agree that aid has contributed to the dysfunctionality of African governments. And I almost fell off my seat. I said, Minister, you're making my case for me. And I think it's really an important statement, particularly given what I said the second point was, that we need to motivate African governments to do the right thing. And for a minister of one of the largest and most generous uh, um, givers of aid to say that we have to accept that aid is contributing to dysfunctionality was very worrying indeed. I will come back to this point in a few moments, but before I launch into my vitriolic attack as to why aid is not working, I want to just spend a few things, a few, a few moments actually just clarifying some of the um, sort of the assumptions that I've made in the book. First of all, um, on page, I think it's seven of the, of the book, I'm talking about um, a particular type of aid, and in fact, I go through three different types of aid. The first type of aid is what I call humanitarian or emergency aid. This book is not about humanitarian or emergency type of aid. I believe that there is a moral imperative for us as human beings and being part of a global community to actually act when there's a tragedy, wherever it may be. So I think the most recent tragedy in Haiti is an example of this. Um, obviously the tsunami, the earthquakes in Iran, the floods in Mozambique, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is we're an international community, we're human beings, we're linked by common, um, commonalities. Um, if there is a tragedy, we should step in. So this book is not about humanitarian or emergency aid. The second type of aid is what I call NGO or charitable aid. So this is a type of aid where we give $20 to build a well in Ghana or $10 to help support a scholarship for a girl to go to school in Zambia, which is where I'm from. This book is also not about that type of aid, um, although I must say that both these type of aid uh, of AIDS, um, both humanitarian or emergency aid and NGO aid, both have problems, serious problems, um, and that will probably be in the sequel to Dead Aid, but <laughs> this book is not about that. I myself am, am in, involved in a number of charities, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later, I'm sure, but I think what we need to take away from our charitable interventions is we need to be much more humble about what those type of interventions can do. To give you some statistics, and by the way, I should have, I mean, the disclaimer is that I'm an economist, which means I throw in a lot of statistics every now and then just to illustrate the point. But just to give you an indication about the current situation in Africa, there are about a billion people on the African continent. In 1970, about 10% of Africans were living on less than $1 a day. Today, over 70% of Africans live on less than a dollar a day. And over the past 50 years, over $1 trillion of aid has gone to Africa. The question is, what is going on here? We've been handing out money for five decades, and things have gotten worse. Paul Collier, who was my PhD supervisor and who has written a fantastic book called The Bottom Billion, has talked about the fact that Africa is shearing off from the rest of the world. So the rest of the world is going in one direction, and Africa is going in a completely different direction. So this book basically was trying to figure out and to explain why it is the third type of aid, which is the billions of dollars of aid that go from government to government um, every year, as well as the big institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF that go to the, from those institutions to African governments every year. Current estimates are that that is over $50 billion a year. The $1 trillion number that I gave you is equivalent to $100 for every man, woman, and child on Earth today. And still, we've seen no results. I want to spend a moment now to take you back in time into the 1950s to give you a reason as to why it is the case that the aid model actually developed. 
I often say to people that if I had been a policymaker in the 1950s, just after World War II, I definitely would have supported aid to Africa. It seemed logical, and there seemed to be evidence that actually would work. Let me just spend a moment here and tell you what I mean. Economists in the room will be very familiar with a very simple equation, which is that savings will lead to investment, and investment will lead to growth. Very simple. What happened was that at the time when aid, was, we were just coming out of World War II, and when the aid model actually came into fruition, we had just come out of a period where many African countries and many small countries around the world had actually emerged from colonialism. Many of these countries, because they were just create, newly created nation states, actually didn't have much savings in their economies. So what happened was the international community got together, not too far from here in Bretton Woods, and decided that they were going to actually provide money to these economies, and that savings, the international savings, was going to spur investment, and that was going to lead to growth, very simplistically. So on that basic basis, there are two metrics that we should be concerned about. One was growth, because as I said, savings, investment, growth. And the second one was the alleviation of poverty. The reason why my book is a critique of this third type of aid is because what we have seen in the past 50 years where aid has been going to Africa is we have seen Africa's poverty levels rise and we have seen Africa's growth rates plummet. So on those two metrics alone, aid has not done what it was, me was meant to do. I will come back to the point on what it is, um, why it is that um, I think aid is not working in a moment, but I just want to also very briefly talk to you about one of my greater concerns, which is the, the fact that we've got to a point now that it's virtually impossible to have a discussion about logic and evidence around aid without the counter argument, which is basically fueled by emotion, being thrown at you. This has unfortunately been led by, I believe, the celebrity culture. The reality is, if the celebrities used their platforms, and of course many of us love their music, I love U2's music, I just don't want them designing economic policy. <laughs> My view is that if they use their platforms to show Africa in a positive light, I would be 100% behind them. The problem is that they use their platforms to show Africa as a place of war, disease, corruption, and poverty. In the book, I call it the Four Horsemen of Africa's Apocalypse. We'll come back to this point a little bit later, because although I'm going to focus here on the economic problems of aid, there are a number of African presidents, at least six across the African continent, who have been arguing that we don't need any more aid, but nobody cares about what they have to say. In fact, if I asked you in this room to name one or even two African presidents, I think most people would struggle. But if I asked you who actually speaks on behalf of the billion African people on the international stage, I'm sure we can all guess that it would be a list of Hollywood stars and celebrities. This goes to the core of the issue. What kind of society are we trying to build? Americans would be absolutely outraged if tomorrow President Obama said nothing about the financial crisis and left Madonna to go onto the international community to say something. <laughs> but somehow, we think it's OK that Africans are not, have no voice internationally. And I'm not talking about Africans like myself as an individual. I'm talking about African leaders. These are leaders that we have elected. Why are we not holding them to task to say, what is your plan for the future of this continent? We've got to ask ourselves these questions. So let me spend a few um, moments talking to you about why it is that aid doesn't work. I have a list here called my top 10 reasons why aid doesn't work, but I figure I won't tell you all of them because you won't go and buy the book. <laughs> So I'll just give you a bit of a teaser, and I want to just um, start off with the most obvious reason why aid does not work. Um, I, I want to put this one out first because I don't want to spend too much time on it. I think if you went onto the, uh, onto the quadrant into, the, into town now and asked 100 people why they think aid doesn't work to Africa, I think most people would say it's corruption. They would argue that we have a problem, that the money that we're sending is actually being stolen. Now, 
some of my critics have said, oh, Dambisa, you're just talking about something that used to happen in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, um, that, that aid actually does reach its intended, uh, intended goal. And I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely rubbish. I come from a country where, in the past few years, we have spent a lot of money and time bringing to justice our former president who stole hundreds of millions of dollars of aid money to finance his own personal war chest. Right next door to Zambia is Malawi, one of the poorest countries on earth, where the, their former president is embroiled in a scandal for having stolen aid money as well. The notion that corruption um, arising from aid is something of the past is nonsense. It's something that's very live and very real. And there's a reason why every year the Transparency International Index of um, co uh, Corruption Perceptions Index, which comes out every year, ranks African countries amongst the worst performers. In other words, the highest corrupt, uh, highest countries with cor um, corruption. You cannot have rent seeking, which is the fancy term in economics for corruption, without there being a rent to steal. And unfortunately, aid money provides that rent. We know it to be true. We know that aid money is being stolen, but what are we doing about it? Nothing. There have been efforts to place conditionalities to actually ensure that the money, or to try and get the money to be directed to the right place. But as I will discuss with you later, the political imperative of the aid system, the fact that Americans, Europeans, and other donors around the world want to see aid money go to Africa, because of that, there's no way that aid stops flowing, even to the most cruel, evil, and vile despots that are running that continent. Putting corruption aside, we have evidence it's not cooked up in Dambisa Moyo's kitchen. There's a lot of evidence in the research, academic research, research from the World Bank and the IMF. These are the institutions that themselves provide aid money. There's a lot of research that aid le leads to inflation. It leaves African countries with enormous debt burdens that they cannot finance. Very often, the money gets stolen before, um, we be, and, and we left leaving the debt burdens for other people to come and repay. And then there are issues of what they call Dutch disease. Very simply, Dutch disease, for people who are not familiar, is basically taking dollars and throwing them into small economies, such as my own country. Having all those dollars of swishing around the economy means that the local currency becomes relatively scarce and becomes stronger. And that means nobody in the international community wants to buy Zambia's products because it's too expensive. What that does to the economy is that the employment is decimated. People lose their jobs. People are out of work. And this, again, is something that is well established in the literature around aid. <coughs> Dependency is another syndrome. If President Kagame of Rwanda were standing here, who's a big critic of aid, um, he's much more philosophical than I am about these, this issue, he would tell you that dependency is a very, very serious problem that, that emerges from aid. You cannot expect to grow or breed a culture of entrepreneurship when actually the institutions and the government are being told that they don't need to do anything, the money's going to come, somebody's going to do the job for you. What I mean by that is that African governments abdicate their responsibilities. I'm going to spend a moment on this point because it's particularly crucial. Let us think for a moment about what the role of government is and think about the way you live in your societies here in the United States. There is a contract, a sovereign contract between you as an individual and the government, the US administration. You agree to be taxed and in return, the US government agrees to provide you with what in economics we call public goods. Things like education, healthcare now, uh, national security, <laughs> and infrastructure. So I'll give you a very simple example of a, of a public good. It's a street lamp. So if you're uh, uh, walking around at night, a street lamp is up. We all benefit from the street lamp because it helps to um, illuminate a, a dark street, but not any single person actually 
pays for that street light. So that's why the government has to step in, tax us for public goods, and therefore provide this benefit to all of us. So I repeat, you've got a sovereign contract. You accept to be taxed, and the government agrees to provide you with public goods, the set of public goods, education, healthcare, infrastructure, security. What happens if the government doesn't provide those goods? Well, that's what the elections are for. Because every four years, every two years, if you include the uh, midterms, you go to your polling booths and you sit there and you think to yourself, has this government done its job in providing me, the individual, for my taxes, providing me with public goods? This is not the situation in Africa. The link between the individual and the government has been severed, has been cut, because African governments need not respond to the individuals on the ground, they need to respond to the donors because it's the donors who are providing them with capital. You might say to yourself, well, what does it matter? Well, it matters because as Africans, even though on many occasions we feel that our governments are failing in terms of providing us with public goods, education, healthcare, infrastructure, and security, the international community continues to support these governments because the populations in the donor countries, so you and I sitting in America, insist that the governments here provide aid money to Africa. What we end up with are African governments who are not accountable to their people, African governments who spend their time courting and catering to donor societies and to the donors, and they spend no time whatsoever listening to what African government, uh, individuals have to say. There's evidence that aid kills entrepreneurship. No surprise that if you look at the Doing Business Around the World survey that comes out every year by the World Bank, African countries are amongst the worst performers. In some countries in Africa, it takes two years to get a business license, to start a business. Does this sound to you like governments that are interested in actually increasing jobs? and providing opportunities for their African citizens to build their tax base? It doesn't to me. People will be aware that over 60% of Africans are under the age of 24. In many countries, over 50% of Africans are under the age of 15. So we have very young populations across the continent, people desperate to get an opportunity, and the governments are making it virtually impossible for them to get jobs. Why should they care? After all, they can get money to pay the army to stay in office for 25, 30, even 40 years. President Mugabe in Zimbabwe just announced that he's going to be um, uh, head of state and, you know, for another five years. He's already 85. And I would encourage you to go and look and see how much money the US government, your tax money, is being sent to Zimbabwe to support that regime. Because publicly, we can all watch CNN and say he's doing a bad thing, but there is an American ambassador living in Zimbabwe. There's a British high commissioner living in Zimbabwe. Never left, never signaled that it was unacceptable that people are being massacred and the economy completely obliterated. So what kind of society are we trying to build? There's a growing literature that also looks at the links between aid to Africa and civil unrest, civil wars. In the 1990s, Africa had more civil wars than the rest of the world put together. In the past 18 months, there have been six coups across the African continent. It should come as no surprise to you then that this continent is always characterized as a place of high political uncertainty and volatility. The reason why aid is linked to civil wars is that people are constantly, the factions are constantly trying to capture the state, the presidency, because that's where the money pulls from the donors. It's of great concern to the average African. I was saying at lunch um, today that um, there were actually, it was a young, young group of, of people, many of them born in 1991, 1992. In Somalia, anybody who was born in 1992 
So anybody who's 18, and I think many of you in this room are 18, anybody who's 18 or younger has not spent a single day in school. So we're sitting here, and you have the good fortune to be studying at an amazing institution. There are people your age who have not spent a single day in school. And those people are becoming pirates. Um, in Somalia, as you recall, about a year ago, there was a Somalian pirate, 17-year-old, who was being uh, been arrested. And they're also becoming terrorists. If you ignore everything I say today, I hope that you will remember one point, which is the point I'm about to make, which is that aid disenfranchises Africans. The average African is disenfranchised. I think it's quite apropos that we're in New England because, um, again, at lunch today, I noticed that there were a number of people who come from Massachusetts. And so we'll be very familiar with the Boston Tea Party, where the slogan was, no taxation without representation. Well, in Africa, we suffer from the opposite, or what I call the reverse Boston Tea Party, which is that there's no representation because there's no taxation. Until African governments feel that there's a symbiotic relationship between us as individuals and the government, they don't care what we think. And it goes to the heart of the political system that you live with in the United States, and it also illustrates why the aid system has continued to support a system uh, of, that does not produce results across the African continent. One of the things that I had the opportunity to do while I've been traveling and marketing my book is to sit down with the head of one of the largest aid institutions in the world. And he said to me, and I have to say I left the meeting incredibly distressed. He said, out of 50 countries on the African continent, only two countries could he be sure that the government could produce a report on either education or healthcare or infrastructure, any of the key sectors of the economy. And he said, this is, by the way, 50 years after independence for many of these countries, and the governments are failing to write a report about education or about healthcare. And he said to me, the thing that's disheartening is not that there's a lack of capacity. There are Africans who can re write reports and who are African doctors who can write about HIV, AIDS, and malaria. There are African teachers who can talk about girls' education. But the problem is that the system has created a situation where African governments have abdicated their responsibilities. They sit there and say, we're not going to hire anybody to do this job because there's an aid agency from abroad that's going to come and do it. And they've created a symbiotic relationship between the two of them, again, to the detriment of the average African. <coughs> now that I've depressed you completely, <laughs> I'm going to spend a bit of time to talk to you about what we should be doing instead. I just want to start by saying, to the extent that aid has worked anywhere, it has been very different from the type of aid that we're seeing going to Africa today. And I should start by saying, even before that, that there is not a single country anywhere on Earth, anywhere, that has achieved economic growth and reduced poverty by relying on aid to the extent that African countries rely on aid today. So we are pushing a policy onto the African continent that has no evidence anywhere of working. And more importantly, it, doesn't, it, defines, it defies logic. Giving money to people without any requirement for performance, we can only expect that there'll be poor results, which are the results that we see across the African continent. Yes, aid worked in the case of the Marshall Plan. Yes, you could argue that aid worked for the Green Revolution in uh, India. And yes, you could even argue that there are a handful of countries, what they call the aid graduates, which I talk about on page 22 of my book, which are countries that have achieved growth and did take aid early on. But the difference between those scenarios and the scenario of Africa today is that in, those, um, in the former case, those countries, the money was given short, sharp, and finite. The Marshall Plan was $100 billion in today's terms. It was a five-year program. These are not open-ended commitments. In Africa, 
it's an open-ended commitment. There's no discussion about the day when aid will end. In fact, if you raise the question about perhaps weaning Africa off of aid and looking for some of alternative ways of financing development, you're pilloried, you're screamed at, you're accused of being racist, you're accused of being somebody who wants to kill African babies, as Jeffrey Sachs has accused me. In fact, his exact quote was, this book has been written by somebody who doesn't have a child in rural Africa, to which I responded, is he trying to tell us that he's got a love child in somewhere in Africa? <laughs> In any case, the point being here on a serious note is that we need to have this discussion. There's no point in pretending. As an African citizen, I am worried that one in three Zambians is HIV positive, and yet 97% of the infrastructure, the medicines that are being handed out to Zambians is paid for by the US taxpayer. America today has a 10% unemployment rate as we well know. It's coming out of a financial crisis. It's got a lot of structural issues. Whereas in the past, unskilled workers in the United States could simply be provided with government uh, bailouts through a Keynesian or a fiscal stimulus, the world has grown up. There's a lot of competition outside of the United States. If you include people who have PhDs and are driving taxis, for example, so people who are underemployed, we're going close to 20%, one in five Americans is underemployed or unemployed. Does it make sense, therefore, for the Zambian government to sit back and fold its hands and wait for the American government to provide us with HIV medicines? The situation in America is not just a US-specific situation. Most donor countries are suffering from the financial crisis and from structural problems. You have heavy debt levels, massive fiscal deficits, unprecedented, and you have aging populations, which means that the burden in terms of pension funds will continue to grow. Does that make sense then? Does it make sense for Africans and African governments to sit on their laurels and just wait for the next handout? To me, I would say just no. Let me spend a bit of time now talking to you about some of the alternative ways of financing economic development. Again, these are not things that I've just kind of cooked up. They are tried and tested over 300 years of evidence that there are ways to actually improve people's livelihoods and create economic growth. So it's good news. The first one is trade. Now, there's a lot of talk about trade now, I know, in the United States because of protectionism, and I'm not going to spend too much time here. But the fact of the matter is that we know that every year Africa loses about $500 billion of earnings because the goods that Africa produces, agriculture produce in particular, is shut out of the United States because of the farm subsidy bill and shut out of Europe through the uh, common agriculture policy. My advice to African governments is that they should stop wasting their time trying to negotiate the WTO rounds, spending their time coming here and negotiating. I pride myself on being a realist. The fact of the matter is the American government would be insane to basically open the markets for Congolese, Zambian, Kenyan, Ghanaian farmers to sell the goods here and put out uh, an at the expense of an American farmer in uh, Wisconsin or Michigan or Iowa. So the fact of the matter is very realistically, it's not going to happen. The good news is that there are other places that desperately need African produce. By 2030, there will be an additional 2 billion people in the middle class on this planet, many of them coming from places like China and India. China, for example, has only 7% arable land. It desperately needs to feed its population. Africa has 80% of the untilled arable land that is left on Earth. So instead of wasting our time trying to sell goods into America or Europe where you don't want our products, it's much better for us to spend our time trying to sell our goods into places like China, India, and Brazil, and so on, where they do need our products. And I say need because they don't have the land to actually grow their own produce. Just another point about trade, and just to illustrate the lazy muscle of many African leaders, tariffs even between African countries remain 
in the 30-40% range. So if I want to buy goods between, call it Kenya and Uganda, the tariffs are absurd. So it's not just inter-regional trade that we should be worried about, but also within Africa, intra-trade, still we have a long way to go. The second point here of another way of financing economic development is through foreign direct investment. This is a very straightforward thing to do. There are billions of dollars from pension funds, insurance companies, asset managers, hedge funds that are desperately looking for places to park money. The fact of the matter is, African countries do not create environments where people want to invest their cash. I went from Rwanda, Kenya, and Tanzania. These are three countries that are right near each other. I needed to change my currency three times and to get three visas. Does this sound to you like governments who are serious about creating jobs and opportunities for their people? The answer is no. Why should they care? They can stay in power. They're getting aid money. There's no incentive for them to do the right thing. The third way of raising financial capital is through the financial capital markets, issuing debt into the capital markets. This is a better way of raising money than through the aid system. Why? Because it provides transparency. America, Britain, China, India, Brazil, these countries all go to the international capital markets in a very transparent way. Investors look and decide are you doing the right thing? If you are, we will lend you money. If you're not, go and clean up your house before we lend you money. African governments, up until recently, have not been coming to the international capital markets. The international community has told them not to issue debt, has even told African countries not to get credit ratings. Now, we all know that credit ratings aren't perfect, but they still are a good gauge, a good guide of what countries are doing the right things, and what countries are not. Some people say to me, oh, this is ridiculous. Why would an African country go and issue debt in the capital markets and pay 10% interest rate when they can go to the World Bank and borrow at 0.5%? Well, I'll tell you why. Yes, while it's true on it, that on a financial cost basis, it's more competitive to go to the World Bank and not go to the international markets we're forgetting a very big cost, which is the stigma. By not going to the international capital markets, most investors will not be interested in investing in your country. They, going to the World Bank window to borrow money is viewed as a place for basket cases. Countries that have their story straight, that are fiscally responsible, are showing good policies that can generate long-term economic growth, they don't need to go to the World Bank they can go to the international capital markets. And we've seen the cost of debt come down from 10%, 5%, even 3% for many countries. So financial capital markets is another tool. I'm happy to say, um, although I'd like to take full credit for this, um, I, I can't, but I'm happy to say that Kenya is coming out with a billion dollar bond. Tanzania is going to be out with a bond. There are now 19 countries in Africa that have credit ratings. So they're making progress. I have seen letters from the international community to ministers of finance in Africa telling them not to issue debt, not to get credit ratings. Why? What is the problem? I won't go through the, other, um, the others in great detail, but things like microfinance are ways for individuals to actually participate, to help support entrepreneurs in Africa who are looking for capital. Things like remittances, there's a lot of innovation, particularly in Israel, around um, uh, remittance bonds, investment using uh, remittances, monies that of people who are um, from these different countries but living abroad. Savings, taxes, the list goes on and on. And even aid, there are some very innovative programs that we see around places like Mexico, these conditional aid transfers. And there's a lot of issues around this because I know um, Mike Bloomberg is, is looking at, at um, similar programs in New York where you pay or reward um, individuals for doing the right thing. So for example, a mother takes a child to be immunized, you pay her $10. A mother um, sends her kid to school, the, the uh, attendance rate is 85%, you give her $20. There are lots of issues, but the fact of the matter is there's some innovation going on here. 
I never thought I'd be quoting George W. Bush, but here we go. <laughs> the guy actually said something pretty interesting, which is that we should all be careful of the soft bigotry of low expectations. And the problem around Africa is that, is exactly that. We have very, very low expectations of this continent. And that is why, even though there are more poor people in China than there are in Africa, and that there are more poor people in India than there are in Africa, we don't feel sorry for the Chinese, and we don't feel sorry for the Indians, but we feel sorry for Africans. And African children are used on a regular basis by charities to raise more money for a system that we know has no evidence anywhere of working. I'm going to end up here with a quote from a friend of mine, Nigerian friend, and for those of you who know Nigerians, you know that they don't, they're not shrinking violets. <laughs> so my friend said to me, why are you bothering to write this book? It's a complete waste of time. Everybody knows that A doesn't work. In fact, he said to me, Dambisa, Africa is to development what Mars is to NASA. He says every year, NASA spends hundreds of millions of dollars doing experiments, writing reports, analysis on Mars. And just the same way that the aid community spends hundreds of millions doing research, experiments, and writing reports. He says, but the fact of the matter is nobody actually believes that we're ever going to live on Mars. And the fact of the matter is the problem is that nobody believes that Africa will ever develop. I thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. take questions right now. I just ask that uh, when I recognize you to ask a question, we have microphones here. Please wait till the microphone is you know, in your hand uh, because we want to record all of this and make sure that, um, you know, that everything is uh, on, on the videotape. So in, as our tradition here at the Dickey Center events, we always give priority to students. So students, raise your hands with questions. It's your turn. Student? Great. There you go. Right here. So, so uh, the, the <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> the, the first, th thanks so much for, for coming and talking with us. Um, I, so, so if, if um, the, the total GDP of, of Africa is around one and a half uh, trillion dollars, is that right? That's the amount of aid money that's gone to Africa. Or, what, but 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 e currently currently that's I think mm -hmm. that's all. It's like 1.6 yeah, trillion is, is right. the annual G, uh, yeah. GDP as mm -hmm. well. What perc what percentage of that actually goes to the governments from taxes or tariffs or, or anything else? What what do you know what the sort of the net um, government budgets are? So just to give you, I'll give you a specific example. For on average, African governments take about between 50 and 60 percent of aid money. Um, taxes are about 4% of, total, this is gov of government budget, so this is not of GDP. Of, G yeah. of GDP, aid is about 12%. Um, so if you're, you're looking at, I mean, there are countries that are, are taking about 90%. Places like uh, Ethiopia, uh, Guinea are taking 90% of their budget being aid. Um, so it's, it's, for many countries, this is why the link, on the p political link of, um, that I described earlier is a, of, of a crucial concern. So, so, so I, I just... Uh, just help me understand this, because I, th I thought you said you said about fifty billion dollars in aid annually at this at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. Um, and so, so the the total GDP in, in Africa is about one point six trillion, mm -hmm. which is closer to th that's about three percent. That a, that includes North Africa. What okay. you're, the estimate you're giving me is includes yeah, North Africa. Yeah. Yeah. So so so, so it, it goes it goes up to a little, but but it's still nowhere near twelve percent, right? Of what GDP or of 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 of, of the the sort of aid to. Um, uh, aid to GDP right <coughs> Aid to GDP to, in Africa, it, these are talking about, you're talking about governments, right? So government aid to GDP ratio for a country is about 12%. Mm -hmm. It varies, of course, but yeah. it's around 12%. But I'm talking about the share of aid to the government budget, mm -hmm. okay? And that number is about 60%. That's, that's 60%, I and mean, then it varies depending on the country. And it's very high for, for obviously, for many other I countries. I was just curious about that. The numbers are in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I 
thanks. Um, so if you could take over the entire distribution of aid to countries in Africa and could make changes to it, because it's not going away anytime soon, what changes would you make to the way it's distributed, how much, and to who? The main thing I would do is I would make it finite. I would go country by country, and I'd say, okay, you, Mr. Ghana, are doing pretty well. You've got a B, single B, double B rating, um, and uh, you have, you've got the, the general policies um, on, you know, on, uh, on paper correct. So I'm going to give you, call it, I don't know, 10 years or 12 years um, more of aid. And I'm even willing to entertain the debate of whether we should triple or quadruple the amount of aid over that period of time. But the fact of the matter is I will have to issue a credible and serious promise that in those, over that period of time, the aid would be com concluded. There are some initiatives. The fact of the matter is one of Africa's biggest Achilles heel is that it lacks infrastructure. It's very well known. Um, in fact, if you look at wages um, for an African to produce a widget, um, it is often cheaper than it is to produce the same widget in Asia. But when you add in transportation costs, it gets too expensive. And so that's how we get priced out of the market. So obviously infrastructure is a big issue. There are some very interesting initiatives coming out of Singapore and China right now around doing infrastructure into Africa. So your question about what would I be targeting, I'd be targeting infrastructure because we're looking for structural change. Um, I would also look to, um, to look at something called the Pan-African Infrastructure Development Fund, which was set up by the South African government. They have a triple B rating. So the uh, South African government has basically said to investors, put money into this fund. We will pay you back. And we can assure you that don't worry if you're trying to build a railway in Congo and you're worried about Congo. We, the South African government, are going to provide a guarantee. And people have felt very comfortable. They've raised um, over a billion dollars doing that. So infrastructure is the big problem here. Um, I would also focus a lot in regional integration, because that is a very, very big problem that we have in Africa. Um, my example here is I come from Zambia. As I said, uh, you know, it's 10 million people. I mean, frankly, who cares? Nobody. Um, but Zambia is part of Southern Africa, which is about 200 uh, million people. It's a very different proposition for investment and for job creation. But there's still many structural problems in terms of our integration in that way. So those are the things I'd focus on. Of course, there are some immediate needs in the healthcare area, in education. But I think there's no point in handing out the money to do those programs if we're not having the discussion about what African governments in 10, 20, 30 years, what are they going to be doing to raise the money themselves to finance those programs. So that's what I would do. And then I'd turn off the tap. Um, you talk a lot about, uh, mostly about w uh, Western countries giving aid. Um, I was wondering what you thought of, for example, say, China giving aid to uh, various uh, African countries in exchange for um, equity shares and um, uh, for oil, and um, um, also um, China's involvement in um, uh, infrastructure in exchange for um, uh, various types of mineral extraction and et cetera? Um, so I have a chapter in the book called The Chinese Are Our Friends because I actually think what the Chinese are doing in Africa is the right way to go about things um, very broadly. Uh, we need jobs. As I said, we've got a young population. We don't need pity. We don't need any more handouts. We need jobs. And if Western societies don't want to open the markets for us to trade, fair enough. We get it. But we can't sit around and expect you to just keep giving us handouts, because that's not going to help. There are clearly issues around China being in Africa, environmental issues, labor issues. But it's not the responsibility of the international community to police that. It's the responsibility of African governments to act on behalf of Africans. China does business in America. Nobody complains. China does business in Britain. Nobody says anything. China does business in Africa, everybody's hands are in the air. Oh my God, it's neocolonialism. They're going to get raped and pillaged all over again. Well, that is completely absurd. You know? And there are pressures from individuals on the ground in Africa saying to the African government, we are not tolerating this. You know, there have been instances where the Chinese have come into Africa, they've done things that have been unacceptable, and we've gotten a backlash locally. And that's what we need. We don't need 
people to say, don't invest in Africa because we think that you're going to do bad things there. That's not what we need. We need jobs. And until the aid establishment starts talking about creating jobs, not for Westerners who are looking for jobs to go and do in Africa, but for Africans themselves, with, I do not believe that the aid system works. And I think that the, 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 the clever thing that the Chinese have done is that they're a new suitor in town. You know, they've come with a business acumen and a business interest only. They don't care about religion or, or uh, democracy, or government. They don't care about any of that. They're just there to make money. And the reality is, it sounds cold-hearted, but the fact of the matter is that until we have a middle class in Africa that we can police our own governments, we're just having a nice conversation on, on a, a weekday afternoon. I think we really need to start asking ourselves what kind of society we're trying to build on this continent. And right now, we've just spent 50 years wasting time, especially given what we knew was happening and we knew it wasn't working and we still didn't do anything about it. Let's say uh, rich countries stop giving aid to African governments. How do you propose African governments be reformed? Would you use uh, sanctions or Western intervention, or are they going to reform themselves one, once they are off aid? So um, I, I think we all know that sanctions don't really work. Um, I think you know South Africa was under sanctions for many years. Nothing really happened. Uh, I think that people can say bad things about Zimbabwe and Mugabe and threaten sanctions, but the fact of the matter is, you know, he goes to the, the Pope's funeral and he's in the Champs-Élysées. I mean, we, frankly, the world doesn't really care. Um, I believe that if African governments are left vulnerable, um, so by taking away aid, or knowing that aid is going to come to an end soon, they will start to look, they'll start catering and courting their local citizens, because that's the only way they'll stay in power. And we all know that the one thing politicians care about is staying in power. They really don't care about anything else. So they will have to provide the public goods that Africans are demanding and that Africans need. Right now, the system is such that it doesn't matter if African governments do not do anything. So poverty levels rise, it doesn't matter. No education, no health care, no running water, it still doesn't matter. They still sit in power because somebody is underwriting their projects. So I believe that you will get the governance, you will get all the political systems once the African governments know that they have to work hard to, to earn the respect and be accountable to their local citizens. Uh, you mentioned that trade is an alternative um, for aid, that it doesn't work and trade will work. I'm just wondering exactly what kind of trade, because I mean, we heard a lot about unfair trade, and I've read some examples of how multinat multinational corporations are actually enforcing uh, unfair trade agreements with African countries, because they basically have more resources than African governments themselves. And also about um, resource resources. Um, I'm wondering how actually by um, expanding agriculture or mining or uh, resource exploitation that will help Africa because uh, we heard the concept of oil curse and I think that might apply to any other resources that just by having these resources the governments, the corrupt governments can still maintain um, their practices and new patrimonial practices as well. Yeah. So... Um, with respect to your, your first question, was around tra was around um, trade. Um, could, you, could you just explain what you mean exactly? Uh, there are examples so it's multinationals basically doing trade, and your your argument is that they have more control in, in on the relationship than. Yeah, the African and African governments don't have control. What well. You know what, the fact of the matter is, that to me is ridiculous. And I'll give you a specific example. I'll give China as an example. Um, there are basically three stages of a development project around oil, okay? You've got exploration, and then you've got um, production, and then you've got uh, distribution. The Chinese government will give you a license, if you're a foreigner, to go and do exploration. So people go and do exploration for oil, Companies go in there, do exploration for uh, uh, gold, minerals, and so on. 
When it comes to the time where they've discovered the oil, and it's time now to go and, or, or mine the gold, the Chinese government will tell them, no, we're not going to give it to you. Or they'll give you 1% stake in the business, and the government will take the, will take the rest. Now, a lot of people would argue, oh, well, nobody's going to invest. Well, that's not true. People are clamoring to invest in China. And the same thing would apply in Africa. These are monopoly holdings. You know, they hold a copper mine. It's not like the copper mine's floating around everywhere on Earth. There's enough flexibility for African governments to say, if you don't want to invest in this country under these terms, we're not going to tolerate it. But the fact of the matter is that many African governments have sat around and have allowed the system to um, just allow, you know, allowed international multinationals to come in and do what they want with, with the society. I would also add that it's very important for African governments to stand up to not only to multinationals but also to the international agencies. Because international agencies claim that they are supporting African governments, but actually they tend not to. As I gave an example with the capital markets, they're not encouraging them to come to the international community and be part of the international community as a whole. So I think if you think about um, agriculture, you know, the, the Chinese doing agriculture in Africa, the mining companies going to Africa, it's up to the African governments to say, this is our law, you take it or leave it. If you don't want to farm in Zambia, well, you're not going to farm in Southern Africa because we're part of a regional community. These are the terms. These countries need our, they need our resources. It's just about us taking responsibility for those resources. And unfortunately, that has not happened. Can I just say one last thing on, on that point? Sorry, excuse me. I agree with the oil curse, and I gave the Dutch disease as a serious problem. But remember that you either have resources or you don't. It's as simple as that. You either, you're either endowed with them or not. Whereas aid is a deliberate policy. We're sitting in air-conditioned offices in Washington and saying, let's give these guys more aid. And we're actually introducing negative externalities and problems into these societies that we know exist. As I said to you before, there's no evidence anywhere on earth that there are benefits to providing aid in the amount that they're giving to Africa. We know that there are benefits to trade. We can, we can calculate that. We know that there are benefits to foreign direct investment. We can show that people are getting jobs. There is no evidence that aid has contributed to economic growth or to reduction of poverty anywhere. In fact, where aid has become a key tool for government financing, we've seen performance in terms of poverty and growth worsen. But we still continue to push that as an agenda. So I think that's, that is a, a very important point that we can keep missing. You're right, oil curse, there are a lot of things that come out of the oil, oil curse. There are things like uh, corrupt governments and so on. Um, and yes, there are ways to manage uh, the oil curse. I mean, Norway's done a fantastic job at doing that. But we have to remember we're pushing a policy. It's a specific policy. Sorry, there was a question here. Sorry. <clears throat> First of all, um, I want to congratulate you for writing a, a very good book, especially in a time where we have um, a male-centered uh, society and where we don't have too many African writers writing about these issues. Uh, my question is this. So at the moment uh, in the capitalist system that we have, what, and uh, we, then we turn off the eight taps. Uh, do you think Africa would be able to, to get, to, 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 to develop as fast or to get to the goals where they want? Um, in the capitalist system that we have, because as you just said, like China is able to to have a strong state, and that's why they're able to say no when the the resources are about to be exploited by by outsiders. So I want to know, uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think the the key problem in Africa is that, and and I, my favorite term now is is low hanging fruit. There's some very very basic simple things that African governments need to do. It's not going to take years and yet it will have very, very um, big implications for the continent. I'll give you some examples. Something like regional integration. They can stand up tomorrow, African governments could stand up tomorrow and say, you know what, these five countries in Southern Africa have just signed an agreement and we've decided we're going to have one passport for our region and we're going to work towards having one currency. President Kagame of Rwanda is a specific example. This is 15 years after the genocide, okay? He has been very public saying aid is not helping. 
He stood up. He changed the official language of the country from French to English. He joined the Commonwealth. He put in some serious fiscal austerity measures in the country. Last year, 2009, Rwanda became the best performing country in the world on the World Bank's Doing Business Around the World survey. You might say, well, who cares? They jumped 63 points, 63 countries, okay? So they were at, you know, close to 100. They jumped 63 countries to be the best performer, number one performer in the world. And within weeks, they had $500 million of private capital flowing into the country, creating jobs. Very simple. This is not rocket science. But the fact of the matter is we're still spending time. You know, he gets pilloried and screamed at by the donor community saying you need to take more aid. They've spent, they, the international community, spent three billion US dollars prosecuting people against the genocide. Only three people are in jail from that prosecution. He said, we'll be spending, we'll spend the rest of our lives doing this. We've got no time. Go to Rwanda and go and see what they're doing there. There are very, very simple things that these governments need to do to signal that they're serious. The capitalistic model is basically very simple. Growth is a function of three things. Capital, labor, and technology, or total factor productivity. So computers help us to be more productive as individuals. I used to make one handbag a day. Now with a computer, I can make 100 bags a day. The fact of the matter is Africa has the capital. In fact, there's a fantastic book that was written a few years ago by Hernando de Soto called The Mystery of Capital. In that book, he says Africa would need to continue to receive the current rate of aid flows for the next 150 years in order for us to match the amount of capital that's on the continent. So it's not that the capital isn't there, but the system of property rights, of people being able to collateralize and borrow against their, what they, the, the land that they're sitting on, it's that system that needs to be unlocked. Where labor is concerned, I just told you, whereas a lot of countries where I live, I live in, in Europe, They've got aging populations. Spain has a 25% unemployment rate. There are a lot of countries in Europe that are suffering from high unemployment rates. Africa has people desperate to work. It's got a, such a large young population. Most countries, even the United States, would be thrilled to have such a young population. So on capital, we've got a, a check. On labor, we've got a check. Total factor productivity is where we have a problem because nobody's going to bring computers or total factor productivity transfers into your economy, knowledge-based transfers into your economy, if they think you as a government is just going to take it away through expropriation. And that's where the issue remains. And this is why places like Rwanda are doing so phenomenally well, because they've got a strong leadership, lots of transparency. As I said, within two weeks, $500 million. It's possible. It's absolutely possible. Um, we are talking about all this, I don't know if this is working, but we're talking about all this stuff and I was wondering, are the African governments aware of these conversations that are going on or are we just talking and no one is going to listen? Okay. Well, I, I have, I've had the good fortune to spend time with a lot of African governments and also with a lot of donors. and. The fact of the matter is everybody knows what's going on. The, the emperor has definitely got no clothes on. Everybody knows it's not working. But the fact of the matter is it's easy to take aid money. I was just explaining earlier on. I travel out of England on a plane every week. Once a week, I'm on a plane somewhere, Australia, Brazil, to come here. The only person who I know who travels as much as I do is President Kagame of Rwanda. He's on an, a perpetual international campaign to change people's view of Rwanda. He's in Seattle and San Francisco talking to the techie guys. He's in London talking to hedge fund managers. He's in Asia talking to Chinese investors. He's always on the road. He says to me that there's a very serious problem amongst most African governments. They don't want to do that. So Easter long weekend, can't be bothered to be flying around. I want to spend time with my wife and kids. I'll just call the World Bank and get a, a big check. That's the fundamental problem. And the donors are incentivized to give the money because if they say, if President Obama tomorrow stands up and says, you know what, I think that Dambisa Moore has got some good points. I think we should think about, even think about stopping aid in the future, people will vote him out. So they'll be outraged. So he has to keep giving the aid. 
because nobody wants to have the discussion. And the African governments, it's much easier. There's no penalty. In fact, my, my friends and I in London have a joke that there, there must be some kind of a competition of African leaders saying, no, 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 I basically had a genocide, I had you know, war, disease, and they still gave me money. And somebody else is like, no, you can't believe this. I even had you know, disease and I had you know, higher poverty rates and they still gave me money. There must be some kind of who can, who can outdo the other because they still get money. I mean, how can Zimbabwe be getting money from the US government? It's beyond my understanding. Um, my question was, a lot of these Western democratic countries, um, if they stop giving money to Africa and it makes the government weak, it will allow um, governments to come in that the Western like countries don't want to come in, like different uh, government systems that could, I don't know, like Islamic uh, system or groups and things like that. To Does that open up opportunity that maybe that's why people are afraid to take away that aid? I'm not sure, too sure I understand. So you're saying that the the democratic aid does what? Yeah, so the Western countries, if they start taking away the aid, mm -hmm. you said it, may, it would make the governments um, weak and vulnerable. And so do you think that's maybe a fear that um, the governments that would come in and replace these uh, corrupt governments would be governments that Western countries don't want in there? Well, if, uh, if Western countries want the current you know, group of leaders that we have in Africa, we're really in big trouble. Because, I mean, seriously, how much weaker um, in terms of politicians can we really get? Yeah, but um, like uh, governments that aren't democratic and it would create a similar situation where... Well, ostensibly, African governments are democratic. We go to the polls but it's just that nobody seems to care. Okay. No, I mean, I, I get what you're, I mean, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. I mean, you're, you're basically saying there's a risk that you might have a, a sort of a China or more aggressive government come into power. The fact of the matter is we have those governments already. And, the, you know, the Western societies are supporting them. It doesn't matter if it's the president of Sudan, President Mugabe, you know, Equatorial Guinea. I mean, they're, you know, take your pick. Um, go, if you look at the Transparent International Report, you can see who the, the you know, U.S. government says don't deal with these people, but they're dealing with them. They come to the U.S. Um, I'm wondering about when, if aid to Africa stopped tomorrow or in 10 years, I imagine there would be a pretty major adjustment, even if the governments know that that change is coming. And I'm wondering if in the short term there's going to be a lot of dead babies, or basically if it has to get worse before it can get better. I don't think so necessarily. Rwanda's gone from 70% budget deficit, um, budget uh, share of, uh, age share of, uh, of its budget, to down to 50%. And he's, he's very, very clearly replacing every dollar of aid money with trade money. Trade, foreign direct investment, um, really, really trying to grow the tax base um, and through remittances. So, I mean, I, I cannot see how things can get, well, I can't see how they can get worse, but you know, we're at a pretty emergency state on this continent. You cannot have 70% of Africans living on less than a dollar a day and say, well, we still have a more place to go down. I mean, the fact that some people can go around and talk about giving more aid to Africa after the record in the past 50 years is astonishing. It really is. And as far as I'm concerned, by continuing to do what we're doing right now, you will be guaranteed to have more African babies dying. Guaranteed. Whereas there is more of a chance for us to turn the situation around by doing what other people and other countries have done. Well, I'm not saying try something radical. I'm just saying do what other countries have done. Not only in China and India and Brazil, even on the African continent itself, South Africa and Botswana have not taken aid. Look at their performance record. This is just about political will. And there will be no political will until individuals like you and I tell, call your congressman or whatever and say this is unacceptable. We're not saying don't help Africa. We're saying help Africa in the right way. And that is the key, because people say, oh no, she wants Africa to be left alone. No, I don't. I want Africa to be part of the international community, an equal partner. And that's not too much to ask. We can put a man on the moon, I think we can get poverty down in Africa. We have time for two more questions. Uh, let's play back here.
Um, hello. Sorry. Um, hi. Um, thank you very much for your. Um, it was very eye opening because um, I'm from Tanzania and I've all like it's it receives aid a lot and I never thought of this conversation going in this direction before. It's, and then everything you said, I kept going like that is actually quite true. I, I understand what you mean, but um, where I w um what I find um frustrating is that when I look at the government that is in power right now, like our president going from one country to another, kind of having like a really long holiday all around the world, um, I find it like um, that a lot of things is we have to rely on the government. So I was thinking, is there perhaps something that you think an individual could do instead of the government? Like, cause I feel like if we had to wait for the people who are in power, cause there's so much corruption going on as well. And I just feel like w there has to be something else that w perhaps we could do to p speed up the process. Yeah, and I guess what I would say to you know, Africans in the audience, and not just Africans, but everybody in the audience, is that you should be an, um, an ambassador for the continent and you should challenge the status quo. We're not going to get investment on this continent as long as people think it's some combination of war, disease, and, and corruption. And the next time you see an ad on television, you know, asking an appeal to send $10 using an African child, be outraged. You know, call the place and say this is unacceptable. Because it is unacceptable. You don't see Chinese children and you don't see Indian children. Why should they be using African children on television? And the fact of the matter is, I think, for me, the, the one thing that has been transformational in my little microcosm of the world is getting an education. Because these African governments, they need to be exposed. Um, and not just for the sake of exposing, but the day, and I liked actually what uh, the dean said here earlier, the day when countries start to transform, we'll all be ready to go home. You know, so we should build our human capital so that when we do get the message that there are governments who are serious, the Rwandans, the Kenyans, to some extent, you know, the South Africans, the Botswanans, when we get that signal, we should be well prepared to go back and do something useful there. Um, but that's, that is all we can do. That's all we can Thank do. Thank you. Um, my question is kind of in line with what Sabrina was asking, that most of the people who know about the issue that you're talking about are either political leaders in Africa, because they definitely know what the game that they're playing, or most Africans who have left the continent. Um, the very few Africans, I guess, back home who are thinking about these issues don't really have much of a say, and if they speak up, they're either one um, shut down, or pretty soon they're caught up in the whole political whatever game that is going on in Africa. So I was going to ask, um, in your opinion, what is the role of African youth in their diaspora, not just here, but back home? Because I know a lot of the African youth, are, there are about 200,000 African youth who are in the diaspora, and that's a huge brain drain to the continent. And you can't ask an African youth who struggled enough to, I guess, leave the continent to come here to get an education to go back. So I'm just wondering, what, in your opinion, is the role that African youth, especially in the diaspora, have back at home, and how can they bring change to their own continent, but at the same time be able to stay maybe, maybe in the US or in um, Europe in order to better themselves, but still have an effect in the continent? That's a very good question. I mean, I guess the thing that, um, First of all, it's a very difficult question because I don't think there's one answer. Um, the thing that I feel um, sad about uh, when, I, when I've traveled across the African continent is I feel that increasingly people on the ground are detached, are detaching from the rest of the world. And I think, I mean, I, I remember growing up you know, in Zambia you know, throughout my high school, my university years, um, and the fact of the matter is I feel like we were more connected internationally and over time, unfortunately, in a world where there's Twitter and Facebook and all this kind of stuff, I feel like there's almost a detachment that's happening from the continent. And I, the, I think the thing that we, uh, people who are in the diaspora or um, you know, living internationally can do is to, to somehow keep the com lines of communication open. I think that most of the places I've been to in Africa, people nodded emphatically, they agreed. Um, 
I was very impressed to say we sold, I have to say this because I was shocked, but we sold um, over 3,000 copies of Dead Aid in Africa outside of South Africa. So this is in sub-Saharan Africa. People are, you know, they're buying a book in Africa. Um, we want to engage in the debate. They came to the auditoriums. We talked about these issues, but I feel like they are feeling slightly detached. Um, and I think that's part of the point about education, that somehow if they are aware about the things that are going on, the innovations that are taking place, whether it's microfinance, whether it's um, debates about pol um, politics and political change, it's a, it's a small thing that, so, but to me it seems it's the only thing that can be done because until we get the African government on side, I don't think we can do anything else. Thank so. you very, very much. Thank you.